a very much welcome uh, the historic meeting between the Queen of England, the President of Ireland, and the ministers of the OFM, DFM, Mark McGuinness and Peter Robinson. And I think it brings our journey of relationship building in this island and indeed between these islands onto a new plane. And I would like particularly to think that we will build upon that when Queen Elizabeth visited here and made the positive remarks that she made and visited the Garden of Remembrance. I said at that time that that needed to be built upon. That's what we have been trying to do in terms of this uh, engagement. But from here in, there are issues which need to be uh, brought to conclusion, specifically the issues of uh, the legacy of the conflict, and both governments have a big role to play. In that. I know that some people in the north and in my own home district of Bella Murphy, I know that some people there, some families uh, who are big supporters of this peace process uh, are hurt because just last week they were told by the British Secretary of State, Mr. Patterson, that they would not have the type of inquiry that they were looking for, the type of investigation that they uh, wanted. So the, the government in London needs to stop obstructing these matters, the government here needs to press them to do just that. But I think all in all it's a good day for Ireland and it's a good day for the people of these islands. Next speaker is Mrs. Riley from Ireland. Thank you, President. Um, Mr. Volante in his report asked, is, this, is Europe a continent for young people? The Irish poet W.B. Yeats asked, has said, it is no country for old men. But with these austerity measures currently residing right across Europe and in Ireland, it's currently not one for young men, for young women or for young families either. Now this report is quite timely. This summer 70,000 young Irish people are finishing their final state exams. But this year, 70,000 people will emigrate from Ireland. Young people are bearing the brunt of this recession, which is not of their making. Um, economically driven emigration has doubled since 2005 in Ireland, and the social consequences of this are manifested in the little things when we see county football teams unable to field a team because of emigration. We see the decimation of our social and cultural fabric of society. This report on pages 10 and 17, for example, talks about the economic and social consequences caused by austerity programmes and measures. Now, if these austerity policies are, as this report shows, causing economic and social devastation, then why are we allowing them to continue? Why are we not, in trying to protect um, the young generation and prevent their, their sacrifice, why are we not recommending for their discontinuation? Austerity programmes and the policies that they breed are choking growth and the very opportunities like those called for in the draft resolution point 6.1.3 for funding to address these issues. Now I'm sure we're all aware in this chamber of President Barroso's action team on youth unemployment set up by the European Commission. But we are yet to see concrete action on this beyond the spin, the PR and the press releases. Ireland is one of eight prior priority countries on which the Commission has focused. But the one solution advocated by this action team, the reallocation of €82 million Euro of, of unspent, unallocated structural funds, is void in Ireland because we have already spent those structural funds. While simultaneously Ireland is um, burdened under an austerity troika programme which is continuing to exasperate the problems. Now, this report speaks of investing in young people, about including them in decision-making processes, but this generation of EU leaders, of, of essentially of austerity cheerleaders, have no inclination to do so. Where is the investment, the money that is needed to ensure that this generation has a chance? Where is the evidence outside of, the, of this assembly that there is any real intention of empowering young people through investment in training, education and job creation? The blade of austerity and financial crisis is affecting young people disproportionately and at the core of this report and of Mr Hunko's is that austerity is not working and it will lead to further social unrest and an unsustainable economic system into the future.
Minister, the debacle at Ulster Bank continues. This morning we heard from the director, the managing director of branch banking at Ulster Bank, Jim Ryan, who admitted that despite earlier assurances, customers will continue to experience disruption into next week. More than 150,000 people have now been affected by this, this failure. And it's causing, as I'm sure you know, enormous difficulties for families, for individuals and for businesses. And we're almost a week into it and still key questions remain unanswered. And I'd ask you maybe to try and answer these today. Firstly, how did the relatively minor software upgrade lead to such widespread disruption to the bank's payment system? Secondly, where was the bank's disaster recovery safety net? Experts say that the bank should have had a second mainframe operating at a different location, which should have kicked into action when the initial fault arose. And thirdly, Minister, what is to say that this kind of problem wouldn't occur in other banks operating in this state in the future? We know in 2010 that Bank of Ireland experienced problems with its IT system. And how do we know that similar system failures that are being experienced at Ulster Bank aren't unique to them? Ulster Bank haven't answered the questions adequately. And there also seems to be a very slow response from the central bank, from the financial regulator, and from yourselves in government in getting the answer to these questions. So I strongly believe, Minister, that, th that yourselves, the regulator, and the Ulster Bank management needs to come before uh, the houses of the Arathas and answer these questions. And hopefully you can shine so some light on this for myself, but more importantly for the 150,000 people who have been affected so far. Let me turn up by my own experience. I, I wrenched myself very badly there recently while, while cycling, and I had to go to hospital. So I, I went to the Louth County Hospital, to the minor injury unit, and they hadn't the facilities there to deal with me. So they put me in an ambulance and brought me to our Lady of Lourdes Hospital, where I spent the night on a trolley, which I don't mind. I'm not complaining about that. I'm not raising these issues out of any sense of self-promotion uh, at all at all. But it was a very, very worthwhile experience for a member of this uh, legislator. Other people's in trolleys, I was put into a cubicle because obviously they wanted to give me a wee bit of privacy. Very, very elderly people in a corridor. People distressed. One, one young woman. One toilet serving what actually is a, a very, very modern hospital unit. But, but you know, that reminded me of overcrowding in prisons that I have been in. My admiration, my respect, my support for the staff is absolutely unbounded as they dealt with all of these issues. I waited for five and a half hours to be seen by a doctor. And then at half seven, I was seen after midnight. Other people who I talked to were waiting seven hours, eight hours, and so on. I was released the next morning. I was in Drahada. My car was in Dundalk. Now, I then had to go back for other checks. So I'm working here in the Dáil. I left the Dáil. You may have noticed I missed an odd leader's question. Uh, at one point, I drove to Drahada and then was taken by ambulance back to Dublin. So in the course of a number of days, and, I mean, the attention I was given, and I'm sure it was the same attention given to everyone, but in the course of those number of days, I was in three hospitals and in two different ambulances. But what was edifying for me was that I saw the, the real face on the one hand of the professionalism and the attention of all the health workers at every level, but on the other hand, I saw the real distress, real distress, uh, and, and, and sitting in waiting rooms and listening to people and you know, realizing and listening to them telling me that they've been there for 10 hours, for 8 hours, for 9 hours, and so on. So it's like that's the other huge reality for whatever progress has been made. That's the huge uh, reality. And it was just by fluke. You know, I stand up here as you do and we talk about these things just by fluke that I was able to experience some of this. Uh, myself. So I'm not raising this for, for myself, thank God I'm okay, but it's the other people who don't have a voice, who, who can't articulate this, and who are still, as we speak, stuck in the same predicament.